We're so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. My name is Tyler. I'm part of the team here. And if it's your first Sunday with us, uh, we're so thankful that you decided to invest part of your weekend with us. Come on, can we put our hands together for our first time guests this morning? Hey. If it is your first time in the seat back pocket right in front of you, you'll find a connection card. If you'll take just a second and fill that out, you can drop that uh, at the table in the lobby on your way out the door this morning. Our team would love to help uh, get you connected and help you take the next step here at City Church. Come on, join us as we jump back into worship this morning. I'm 
that we serve a God who makes a way where there is no way. Where it looks like sure defeat, you say there's victory. Where we feel like it's lost, in you we win. We, we pray the prayer that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed before they went into that fire. They said, God, whether you deliver us from it or go with us in it, God, we will never bow down to anything else. And so, Father, we just ask that right now, whatever we brought into this room, we don't walk away with it. Because we know that you're making a way, making a way. So we trust you, we look to you, we lean on you, we worship you, Jesus. It's you. So, Father, would you just come and pour into your people? We lift you up, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' precious, incredible, holy name, come on. We all said amen, 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 amen. Man, it is so good to be with you, to see you, to worship with you today. Hey, before you um, before you sit down, will you turn around and, and, and give a little fist bump, a little high five to two or three people, tell them they look good. It's good to see them at church today. And so I know in the room that like introverts are glad when that moment is over. And the extroverts are like, let me keep talking. Come on, I got more to say. Good to go? All right, hey. Yeah, so extroverts are like, I wouldn't done talking, Pastor. And introverts think I just saved them from the apocalypse, right? Uh, I get it, I get it, I get it. Hey, um, uh, we are continuing in our series today. Before we jump right into that, got a little housekeeping uh, update just to like share with you as the church and We've had something kind of pending for a little bit, but we hadn't shared with a whole lot of people because of some unknowns and some things that we didn't, we didn't know were going to, you know, how it was going to go. Uh, but we've had, um, we've had somebody give us a um, really incredible facility and building in Huntington. Now, let me, you may have seen it on, on Facebook that we posted this, and we're incredibly grateful. The valuation on this building is, is um, quite a bit, and and it was just a gift, and we're so incredibly grateful. We don't quite know yet what, what God has in store for, what we're going to do with this facility. Well, I don't have a clue. I don't know. Um, one thing is, I mean, we, we don't feel like it's in, in what God has called us to do, at least in this season, to, to, to be in Huntington or as a church, to move our church over there. But there's a lot of opportunity that we can do with this facility. And so we're just, I'm asking, would you, would you just pray with us? Um, what, about what God would have us to do with this incredible facility. It's uh, on a couple, of, um, a couple of acres right off the main highway. And, uh, you know, one thing that it's, God works in amazing ways because it, it was just a few weeks ago that um, it was right before our anniversary service, actually. I was meeting with Mark Moreno, Pastor Mark Moreno, the night before. And I was talking with him. I was like, man, I'm so grateful for all that God's done in these 10 years. But you know, I, I, I just wonder, like, how do you get from here to there? How do you, how, you know, I, I, I want to see in the next few years our own facility, our own building. Can anybody say amen on that one? I, I want to see what God, God, God would um, do to create real lasting legacy with City Church in Lufkin and make a, a huge difference. And that's, I'm so grateful for all that's already happened. It's like, how, how do you get from here where, where, we're, where we're great and God's blessed us, but we don't have millions? We, do, we don't, you know, we started as a church plant and we, everything was in a trailer gosh, amen, uh, and loaded and unloaded every single week. I'm so grateful that we don't have to pick our chairs up when we leave today because that was our story for a while. But in the same sense, because we've always been portable and we, and we do lease this building and we get an incredible um, deal, and it's an amazing facility. We're, we're saying, what, what, what do you do when you don't have the assets and all these things? And so I'm just telling you this to encourage you maybe in your own life. You're like, I don't know how God can make a way in certain things. That was uh, on a Saturday night. I was talking to Pastor Mark Moreno, on Sunday uh, after service, I got a phone call, and somebody said, we're going to give you this building, and it's valued up to five or $600,000 on this facility. And so I don't know what God's going to do through it, but I know that God's in it, and we're so grateful for it. And, um, and so we're just anticipating to see what it will be next. And so we're asking you as a church family, 
right now, uh, our need is pray for us. We, we, we want to honor God in everything that we do, and we're just so excited about what the future holds, though. And so I believe that this is an investment to what's next at City Church. And so I just want to let you guys know, um, we've been working on it for a little bit, but, but I didn't want to bring anything too preemptively. Um, honestly, you ever been excited about something, you shared it, and it didn't work out? Like, that's kind of where our hearts are a little bit like, okay, I want to wait just a little bit, but... Just so grateful to God, and so again, that's just a kind of a prayer point and an update for the church family to say uh, that that is kind of being transferred in the moment right now, and uh, if, if you go um, through Huntington on, on, the, on the left side of, uh, of the highway, like when you get past Eubank, there's a convenience store, and there's uh, a church facility right there, that's the building, and so we'll, let's see what God wants to do. I'm just, I, just, I just love how God works. I love how God works, so thank you. Thank you for um, the ones who gave it to us for being obedient, hearing the Lord. They, he told me today, I don't have to mention any names, so, um, uh, but thank you. We're just looking forward to what God's doing. Again, we're, we're in part three of a series that we've been in called Finding Jesus. And some of you, maybe through this series, you've been saying, like, Pastor, I didn't know Jesus was lost. Like, where is he at? Does he know he's lost? I mean, does he think he's found? Um, I remember being that kid in the store before, right? And you walk, like two, two seconds, you walk away from your mom, and you're like, Mommy, where are you? And next thing you know, your name's coming over the pager because mom can't find you. Rest assured, Jesus is not lost. But here, here, here's, the, here's the nexus behind this series, is that sometimes the real authentic Jesus, who he really is, gets lost. Gets lost in translation in our culture, in our own assumptions of what we believed about who Jesus is, who God is, and, and, and what's been taught about him. And all these different things can maybe skew how we see, how we view who Jesus is. And it really matters. And we've said a statement over the last few weeks, every week, and, and we said this. It matters because how we find him is how we'll follow him. And if we find Jesus as some kind of disconnected uh, just the story from older times, he was just a good man, a good prophet. Maybe he was God, but he's a disconnected uh, to us God, then that's how we're going to follow him, some kind of disconnected relationship. But if we understand who Jesus really is, that he's with us and he's for us and all the magnitude of what he did, it'll change how we follow him too. it changed everything about our lives. And so that's what this whole series has been about. Each week, taking just a little bit different kind of side view of Jesus, a different angle to um, discover more about who he is, looking at the scripture and what he did. And um, the, the base scripture that we've been looking at throughout the series is in Matthew uh, 16, because just like in our world, there's a lot of thoughts and there's a lot of uh, curiosities and a lot of thinking about who Jesus is. In this day, there was too. Jesus was walking around and he was healing a lot of people. He was doing a lot of things and there was a lot of talk around the world about who Jesus was. And he says this, uh, he, he, it says in Matthew 16, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? And they replied, some say that you're John the Baptist, others you're Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he turns to his disciples and he said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and he said, well, you're the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. And, and Jesus replied back to him. He said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And so Jesus is like, who do, who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? You're following me. Um, who do you say that it is that, that I am? Because it matters who we, say, who we say Jesus is. And Peter's revelation of Jesus became the foundation that everything else was built on. Right. He said, that Peter, that's the rock that I'm going to build everything on. And, and the same for our lives. The revelation that we begin to have of who is Jesus becomes the foundation for everything else in your life. How we find him determines how we follow him. So we have to get an accurate view and follow the real authentic Jesus. Right? And so today we're going to look at a little bit different angle and aspect of Jesus. This one is a little bit different. Um, of an aspect. And today we're going to talk about Jesus as the Word. Jesus is the Word. And you're like, what does that even mean that Jesus is the Word? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about how Jesus is, um, is the Word. 
Have you, have you ever had um, like a nickname before somebody called you, right? Uh, maybe like a title even that you had like a job or a title or a nickname. How, how about like anybody with me, Maverick or Goose? Anybody? From top, top Gun fans? If you don't know what I'm talking about, gosh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're all going to come to my house and watch Top Gun after service, right? If it, maybe you got a nickname. Okay, depending on your generation, maybe it's, maybe it's honey or baby or babe or boo or bae or I don't know what you well, – depending on where you're at, BFF, what's up, champ? You know, you, you, you got that one. Or, or, or Tiny, right? It, you know, we, we always know the person named Tiny is never little, right? Uh, it's like this guy going to be 7 foot 3 and 400 pounds, Tiny. But we, we, we know the, like, the nicknames. What about titles? We've had – Doctor, president, mom, CEO, all these different titles and nicknames, things that people are called. A lot of people call me P.E., P.E. I think it fits because Pastor Eric, but also my, my, my two favorite classes was lunch and P.E. in school. So, you know, I guess that, that's okay. P.E., P.E., you know, but think about it. No matter what nickname that it is or what title you've ever held, and what title maybe you hold right now, you, usually those are like given to people based off of who they are, the characteristics of, of, of who they are, something they've done, maybe you've done something funny, you never can live it down, you know, uh, you fell down one time, they call you Sir Trips a lot or something, I don't know, and that's like, that's the nickname you're going to live with till the day you die. You'll see people from school 30 years later like, oh, there he is, right? Because something that we've done or a characteristic about us, and it's interesting, as you look through the Word of God, we're going to see so many different titles and names for God. And in a similar way, it kind of works like that when it comes to God. Whenever you see a different name or title for God in the Scripture, it's describing and kind of uncovering a, no, a different nature and characteristic of who He is. Like, it's, it's a descriptive title of, 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 of who God is and, you know, Je Je Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah uh, you know, we see these names in the Old Testament and the Bible. There are different characteristics and names and titles given to God. And, and so the same thing as we, as we look today and we understand what does it mean for Jesus to be the Word. It can seem like a little bit odd phrasing at first, but there's, there's so much to it for Jesus to hold this title. He, he is the Word. Like, I think we understand, we probably all agree that there's importance to the Word of God, right? And I think people, even who aren't Christians, understand that the, the, this Bible, the, the Word of God, is an important, important book. Now, for us, we know that we find life in this book. We, we, find, we can un discover who God is and the character of God, the story of God throughout, throughout the Word of God. And we also know that, I mean, how incredible it is that we can walk with the Spirit of God and He will speak to us and we can listen for His his words. But what does it mean that Jesus himself is the word? Because John, in John chapter 1, describes Jesus as the word. Let's look at it. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, it says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. He's making his point very clear by saying it multiple times in different ways. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Check out verse 14. Then the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the, the glory of the one and the only son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. What's John saying? Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the Word. And as it comes to, like, the Word, as it comes from God, like, like with us, as I write down a word, there's not much power to it, right? I can write down a word in my journal. I can speak a word, and my kids forget about it in the next 30 seconds. Like, wake up for school. Like, it, I didn't even say anything, you know? It's like it didn't exist, those words. Anybody ever? Sometimes, you know, our, our words... They're, they're just forms of communication. That's not, that's not the way that God works. God's words have creative action behind them. When God speaks, something happens. When God speaks a word, things begin, things change, things move. And the scripture said in Genesis 1-1, right? We know that scripture. 
In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And so there was. God said, let there be. And every time God spoke and God said, something became. Isn't that cool? Like all that has to happen is one word from God. And, and it's created. There's a creative action behind any word that God says or speaks. And as we see in the scripture, what's so interesting about Jesus holding this title as Jesus is the word. It's like Jesus is the living embodiment and the living expression of the very word of God. So all things that were spoken by God are becoming expressed and they'll be fulfilled through the person of who Jesus is. The holy word of God, all the things that God has ever spoken wrapped in flesh and bone and blood. Jesus is the word. And think about it, in the past, from the beginning of creation all the way up until Jesus, like the only way that you would know God was through God's word. And here's how it would happen. God would speak to a certain person, usually somebody named a prophet. God would speak, and then that person would go and deliver that word to people. And it's the only way they knew the characteristics of who God was and how to follow after God. There was, a, there was a distance between God and people. And the only way they knew about him was based off of words spoken and words given to them. And then these words then were collected into a diff different books. And then from this book, they would study. We know in Jesus' time that, that the Jewish people would have known and memorized most of the Old Testament Bible. Like they would have known it. And that's how they knew God. They knew God through this word. It's interesting. It's what John was saying. The God that you know through this word written down, this word that's passed down from gener generation to generation, the word that God spoke to prophets and gave to you, this, the, the way that you know God, this, this God has now become a person. This God has now put flesh and, 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 and bone and blood on, and he's among you. He's living among you. Jesus didn't just come as another person to share God's word as a good prophet or a good person or a good teacher. He came as the living embodiment of the very word of God. Every single thing that God ever spoke will be fulfilled through the person of Jesus Christ. It was just from the very beginning of creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things that were made were made through Him. Okay, so what does that mean? That's a lot of words in the little... Even creation itself, when God spoke, Jesus is the one who went out and created it. Jesus is the action behind the Word of the Father. Right? So God speaks, and Jesus is the creative action behind... The words of God. And so Jesus, whenever, whenever man was separated from God and we had no hope and no way back to God, God spoke there in existence a way to come back to him. And Jesus came and was born and then provided a way back to the Father. Jesus is the word. Do you understand how big of a deal that really is, that Jesus is the word? Everything fulfilled through him. And whenever Jesus came to the world... Like, everything then began to change. Like, creator God became human. Heaven, like, overlapped and invaded earth. Light, the most incredible light, pierced and, and broke through the deepest darkness. What was impossible in no way now became possible. All because Jesus came to fulfill every word ever spoken by God. And we can talk about so many things of what it means to be Jesus being the word. Like it's, it's so rich in depth that we could do a whole theological seminary class on Jesus the word. But we're going to just talk about a couple of things today. Um, in Psalm 107... Psalm 107 illustrates a picture of what the word came to accomplish. And in Psalm 107, verse 20, it says this. He, speaking of God, sent out his word and healed them. 
and delivered them from their destruction. God sent out his word. So we know it's not just like a poem he wrote. It's not just something that he said. His word goes out and creates and moves and acts and does. That's what his word. He sends out his word and he healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Here's what I want us to know today, that finding Jesus as the word is encountering Jesus as the healer. Finding Jesus the word is encountering Jesus the healer. Come on, this is important for us to know, that Jesus is the healer. We have to know and believe that Jesus is our healer. When you, when you read the accounts of Jesus, it was not like some abnormal thing for Jesus to heal somebody. You, you walk with Jesus and you read any of the gospel accounts, you know that's pretty much a Monday, right? <laughs> that he's going to heal people and touch people. There's so many accounts as you read through the scriptures of Jesus healing and healing and healing and healing. The blind see, the lame walk, the mute speak. Like pe people that had every kind of infirmity that you could think of would come to Jesus, shout out his name. He lays his hands on. There's this one story uh, of, of, of this leper who comes to Jesus. And a leper, it was, it was a disease that would outcast them from society. And if you were to even be around them, especially to touch them, it would make you unclean yourself. And you would be cast out from the city gates yourself. And Jesus was not scared of anybody else saying whatever they would say. He walks over, embraces this guy, put his hands right on this leper, and heals him. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the healer. Matthew 4, 24 says this, News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all that were ill with various diseases, those suffering Severe pain, the demon possessed those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he gave them a good lecture. He gave them a good talking to. He really, he really just hung out with them. No, he healed them. Jesus is the healer. He's not just the healer, he's my healer. He's our healer. Jesus did heal. Jesus does heal. Jesus can heal, and I believe Jesus will heal. Jesus is our healer. He, he sent out his word, Jesus as the word, he sent out his word to heal them. When did God's people stop believing in God's ability? God sent out the word to be our healer. Any, anyone in here, you're this kind of person that like you, you can drive down the road and find a beat up, piece of furniture on the side of the road and like you're pulling over. Your spouse is looking at you going like, why are you picking up that junk? Oh, it's not junk. That's the coolest piece of furniture you've ever seen. You ain't just see, you just haven't seen it yet. Like who in here, like you're that person. Like, oh, I can, I'll take, I'll take any broken piece of whatever and I'll fix it up. And then you probably have a spouse that's like, why are we getting that one more piece of junk in my house? But you know, a little bit of wood glue and some nails and some stain and it looks awesome. Um, something that looked like it was way too far broken. It could never be a functional piece of furniture again. Now somebody's willing to pay for it because it's beautiful. And I wonder how so many of us in our own lives, we think that there's parts of us too broken, parts too far gone, parts that, if we're really honest, maybe we even think that even God can't do anything about. But you know, you might be great at restoring things, but Jesus is the greatest restorer. He's able to take things that are out of place and put them back where they belong. He's able to take bodies that are out of alignment and put them back how they're meant to be. He's able to, he's able to take what's fractured and make it whole. That's what Jesus does. He's a great restorer. And, and no matter how broken you think things might be, he is the one who can do it. He, like, we, I, I'm so grateful that we live in a time when we have good doctors. And man, believe me, I take my medication. You're going to be glad that I do, okay? But I also believe that the greatest physician is Jesus Christ. He can heal me. He can touch my life. Think about it like this. What do you think in your life right now is just too far broken? You, you, you've, you've been ready to just put that thing by the side of the road and give up on it. Because you don't think there's a way that it can be brought back together. Maybe it's your marriage. Too broken. Too many things said. Too many years passed. 
I don't know what could happen there. Let me tell you that Jesus restores broken things. Maybe it's your mind and you're just like, your, your thought processes for so long have been off. I don't know if my mind will ever be right. Can I just tell you, nothing's too broken for the Lord to put back together. Maybe it's your heart. One thing I know about life is it has its way of breaking hearts. We trusted people, we've done things, and my heart sometimes, as I go through life, feels like it's just shattered in a billion pieces laying on the floor. But I'm just telling you, our God's really good at creating mosaic pieces and putting stuff back together, even more beautiful than it was before. Maybe it's your emotions, and you just feel like you're an emotional wreck, and you can't, you can't keep a hold of your emotions, and they've got you under control instead of you having them under control. I'm telling you, Jesus can heal that. Maybe it's your dreams, and dreams just felt so far broken, so far, so far gone, so far lost that you don't even hope anymore. You've kind of given up on the idea that God can do anything or anyone could. Can I just tell you that God can do what you never could? We have a story of a couple in the church right now that as soon as they gave up and they quit trying on their own, they're smiling at me because I'm pointing at them right now. As soon as they're like, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do here. Literally a couple days later, God's like, boom, answers, the, answers it. Amen. Nothing's too far broken. Nothing's too far gone. God's our healer. God's our healer. Come on, let's give God some praise. We got to begin to believe again that Jesus is who he says that he is, and he's our healer. And it's, yeah, it, here's the deal. Our bodies as well. God can heal our bodies. Amen. We believe that he's the great, he's the great healer. How often do you do this? Because I do it way too often. I'm going to be really honest with you. Uh, instead of going to King Jesus, I kind of go to King Google, <laughs> right? Anybody? It's like, I'm going to go there and try to find my answers first. And if everything else fails, I'll probably turn to Jesus. But before I do that, I'm going to go on there and be like, made my wife mad. What do I do? Right? Google. <laughs> right? Uh, uh. My left shoulder hurts when I bend over. Google. Like, I don't know. It's just weird things. If people could see our weird search histories, it's like, why is that bird so loud outside the door? What's, am I eating for breakfast tomorrow? That's how ADD I am. Like, all these, but we do that so often with, our, with, with what we have and the hurts and the pains and the things in our hearts and lives, and, and we don't even bring them to Jesus, and sometimes we trust Google more than we do Jesus. And I'm just as guilty sometimes, but we've got to trust that Jesus is who he says that he is. And Jesus, the healer, is, is Jesus the word. He sends out his word to heal. Psalm 107, 20, the second part says, and he delivered them from their destruction. So not only is he our healer, he's our deliverer. Finding Jesus as the word is experiencing Jesus as the deliverer. Jesus is the deliverer. What does that mean? What does that mean? For something to be delivered in this context means for something to slip away, for something to get away, for something to be rescued, for it to be released, and for it to become free. Come on, that's awesome. Through Jesus, we can be made free. In studying the context of this scripture, it's almost like Someone was walking along and like Timmy, right? Timmy got trapped in the whale. Go, Lassie. Go, Lassie. Help Timmy. Timmy, go. Like, anybody know Lassie? Am I, too, am I too old? Nobody knows who Lassie is? Go look it up. So the context of the scripture is almost like somebody who got stuck in a pit and they have no way to get themselves out themselves. That's the context. Where he'll send out his word and be our deliverer so he can deliver us from what we can never deliver ourselves from. Anybody remember in, there was, there was a story in Chile in 2010 of these mine workers. Anybody remember this story? So they were working, and this mine was 2,300 feet beneath the ground. And, and something happened, something shifted, and the tunnel in and out collapsed, and there was no, there was no way to get free. There's 33 workers, and, and like it was this worldwide, I just remember the news and everything for for so many days, everyone in the world like rallied together to try to save these workers. We kind of laid down all of our differences and said, how can we save these people? 
right? And so people were coming together, and it's an incredible story because every single um, worker was rescued and was safe out of this, but it took them uh, 69 days to get them free. I mean, it's crazy. What a crazy story that they fought, that, that they, were, they were stuck down in this place that nothing on their own could ever get them free. And there's such hope in this. Because here's the thing, Jesus goes after the one who's stuck. We read the parable of the, of the sheep, and it says that Jesus leaves and goes after the one. He leaves the 99 and goes after the one who's lost, who's stuck. Like, that's what Jesus does. He goes after this stuck person. And some of us, if we're really honest, and I, I, I've been praying even this morning about places in my own life where if we're, it can be true before God, we'll say there's some places where I feel like I'm just, I'm stuck. I'm just stuck. I'm in the middle of that pit. I don't know how I'm going to get free. And the good news is the deliverer doesn't need you to get you free. You can't do it on your own. He can free you. We have to just let him. We have to allow him in. Some of us, we feel like we're in the middle of that, of that pit, but we have a rescuer. We have a rescuer that it's not like they're taking all this time and they don't even know if they can rescue us. That was the way it was with the, with the, with the miners. Like They didn't know if they were even going to be able to get them out. They were working hard. We already know that Jesus can rescue he is the deliverer. He is the rescuer. He is the redeemer. He's the one who's able and he's willing to come in and set us free, to get us up out of that pit and be able to walk and live freely in the life that we're created for. John 8, 32 says this, then you'll know the truth, the truth about who Jesus is, the truth of what God wants to do for you and in you. It says, and that truth is going to set you free. John 8, 36 says, so if the Son sets you free... You are free indeed, or that word indeed literally means you're free through and through, and through and through. You're completely free. See, with Jesus, there's no such thing as like 30% free, 75% free, halfway free. Like, you know, I'm just a little bit. You're either free or you aren't. And I wonder if so many of us so many of us have settled for being a little bit free. But Jesus wants to completely deliver you. He wants you to experience true and real freedom. I want to get you halfway there. How would the miners feel? They pull them a halfway, and they're like, nah, you stay right there and enjoy the middle of the shaft. Uh, no, they, want, they, 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 want, they, they wanted to be free. They wanted to get completely out. That's what Jesus has for us. And, and so often, though, we settle for just a little bit. Yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm fine. No, I think I have it under control. AKA, I'm settled being 22% free. I don't really want to give God this part of my life. I don't really want to trust God here. What could God do with you completely giving yourself to him? Jesus wants to reach down and I believe set some people free. Jesus has come to set us free. He sent out his word to heal them and to deliver them. What's the, a pit that maybe you're in? Maybe you're sitting in a pit today of addiction. The pills that once helped you manage your pain now control your life. I believe Jesus wants to set you free. The drink that once was just for fun to enjoy the end of a day, now it's become something you can't live without. I believe he can set you free. I believe one of the deepest, darkest pits of our day is the pit of pornography. You read the stats. It used to be years ago it was more of a guy issue. But the stats are not equal between male and female about how many people are caught in this pit that distorts and demeans and steals away a good promise that God has for people and makes it something completely not honoring to God, something that completely takes away from a marriage bed, something that makes an unrealistic view of other people. Maybe you're caught in this pit of pornography and you need freedom. 
And it's one of these pits that even to talk about it brings you so much shame. But I'm just telling you, unless you shed some light on it, you'll never find freedom from it. And there is no shame whenever you bring something to Jesus. He wants to set you free, through and through, free indeed. It's a pit of anger, maybe. Maybe you've got a pit of anger, and you subside it most of the time, but you always feel it in there. You know, maybe you don't even know where it comes from. Maybe it's somewhere in your past, and you're like, I don't know why I'm just so angry. I, I'm just telling you, Jesus wants to heal you from that pit. The pit of your past, the pit of offense and bitterness. And one of the greatest things that the devil will use in your life is being offended from somebody. But Jesus wants to set you free from that. That person's running free and we're sitting here held up in bondage. Maybe a freedom from a pit of depression. Come on. Maybe, maybe you're sitting in a pit of suicide. And you keep having these thoughts over and over and over. And maybe to push pause in the narrative of the sermon for a second, you need to know how valued and how much you matter. Jesus wants to free you from that pit. You feel like you're stuck and there's no way out. I'm just telling you, I'm not alone. But I'm so grateful to God he didn't leave us alone. You have that person you just want to leave you alone sometimes? Thank God he doesn't. <laughs> he keeps coming after us, keeps coming after us, because he's our great healer. He's our great redeemer. He's our great rescuer. He is our deliverer. He's the one that can fix what's broken. He's the one that can pull us from any pit, because there's no pit too deep for the rescue arms of Jesus. There's no pain too great. There's no problem too big. There's no depression too severe. There's no darkness too dark that Jesus can't shine a light on. And some of us, we've been settled into a partway freedom. I said a prayer one time, and you're saved and going to heaven, but honestly, we're stuck up in chains the whole way that we're living. And Jesus said, I've got the keys, baby. Let me set you free. But we have to allow him to. What are you, what are you holding? What are you walking through? What are you setting in? I believe that Jesus has the word is a pretty incredible promise. He's our healer. He's our deliverer, and I believe this today, that he is reaching down today wanting to reach some people. I feel it in my own spirit There's some things he's reaching out to reach into and removing my own heart. He's redeeming. He's setting free. The word has come to bring light and life where there was only death, brokenness, and darkness. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love that the real, authentic Jesus, whenever I follow him, I find the word completely fulfilled through Jesus. Last scripture I want to read you today is in Isaiah chapter 55. As you'd stand up with me as I read this, I want to read this really over you and receive this as a promise from God. Check this out. He says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return empty. God is saying every single thing that I speak comes true. Every single thing that I say comes to pass. But will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose that I sent it out. Come on, Jesus is the word. He's the full expression and the embodiment of the very word of God all come to pass through Jesus. So whenever I find Jesus, I don't just find a good man. I don't just find a great prophet, a good teacher. I find the one who came to fulfill every single word of God. He's the son of God. He's the creator from the beginning of time. God the son come to set me free, to heal me, to redeem me so that I can be all that God has called me to be and make the difference that he's called me to make. I believe there's some of us that are 
that are, that are created and made in this place, in this room, to set the world on fire for the kingdom of God, but we're sitting down in our seats still stuck to it, thinking that we can't do it, but we're one moment of freedom away from making a difference for the kingdom of God. Somebody else's redemption story on the other side of you getting set free and having the boldness to be who God called you to be. Are you stuck today? Are you stuck? Are you? you know, some things broken. Instead of just saying, well, that's just how it is. That's how it's going to be. No, 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 no. Jesus is your healer. Jesus is my healer. Jesus is your deliverer. Jesus is my deliverer. So Jesus, we don't just come in here and patty cake and go through another service and leave and go home. God, we need you right now in Jesus' name to flood this place, to flood our hearts. And God, we don't want to leave the same as we walked in. I don't want to leave with all the same broken pieces all around me that I've been seeing for years and years. God, you can pick them up and put them back together. God, I'm not going to leave things sitting in the same pit anymore. We declare freedom in this room. I'm about to invite you to come forward and we want to pray for you. But before I do that, with your heads bowed, I want to ask you one question. If you're in this place and you do not know Jesus personally, you've never given your life and heart over to Jesus, I'm telling you, every promise that he came to fulfill, he came to fulfill in you as well to bring you to be a part of his family. He did everything that it took on the cross to pay for every, everything you ever did in your life. All we have to do is ask forgiveness and give our lives to him. And if that's you and you're like, I've never made that decision before, but today I can't leave and risk my life not knowing who Jesus is. If that's you and you need to give your life to Jesus, would you just slip your hand up so I can see who you are? Come on, just real boldly. God can only do what we allow him to. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray over you, then I'm going to invite you. They're going to begin to sing, and I, I, I want you, if you need to have a healing this morning, healing in your body, healing in your marriage, there's something broken you need God to heal, or you need to be set free. You feel like you've been stuck in a pit. I want you to have the boldness to step out of your seat and join us up here and let us agree in prayer over you. Because I just believe people are going to be healed and set free today. Come on, I'm going to pray over you. And as soon as I pray, I want you to come forward. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I just ask that this would be a house that truly sees your healing, that sees you move in our lives, that sees your freedom and deliverance. Because, Jesus, you are the word. You're our healer. You're our deliverer. And so we just ask that you would come meet us here today in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Come on, if that's you, if anything, there's maybe something in your body, something in your marriage, the pit that you feel like you're stuck in, come forward right now. You have to give the Lord the permission and the ability to work in your life. One of the greatest ways is to let us pray for you and agree together. Come on, come on.
tired and broken thing, that is who Jesus is. He always is the way when there seems no way. He's always our healer. He's always our provider. He's always our strong tower, our place of refuge. says that we believe Jesus went to the cross, then he died, but that he rose again from the grave. Even to be saved, it says we have to believe in our heart that Jesus is the Lord and confess with our mouth that God raised him from the dead and we will be saved. So Jesus is resurrected. Amen. 
the same one that we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, it's amazing because we don't just worship some historical figure or some thought or some idea. Jesus Christ, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same God that healed the sick in the book of Matthew, he's still alive today. Amen. Awesome, guys. Well, praise the Lord. Can you guys give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Amen. Go ahead and take a seat. We have just a couple of announcements for you. Thank you, guys. That was great. Awesome. Well, just a couple of announcements. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, can we give them a round of applause one more time if you're a first-time guest? You'll see one of these. If you haven't had a chance yet, you should see one of these in the back in front of you, the back of the seat that's in front of you. Just get the card. Uh, we want to connect with you, fill it out, turn it in. I promise you we're not crazy, weird people. We just, we're so happy that you're here, and it, and it just means so much to us. So we want to connect with you. Make sure that you turn that in. Right outside in the foyer, there's a booth for you to put your connection card in. If you said yes to Jesus as well today, if this was your first time that you have made that decision to follow Jesus, we want to connect with you. There's a booth right in the left that says, I said yes. Someone will be there right after service. Make your way over to that booth. Uh, have a couple more announcements. If you are not yet plugged into a small group, I just want to encourage you. We have men and women small group that meet every other week. Uh, if, if you're interested in that, maybe you're new to the community and you're wondering, what's my next step? How can I really get plugged into to the body and start making relationships? You got to get plugged in one of these small groups. The way that you do that is go to ccl.live. I can tell you guys that when me and my wife came here, we were going through probably one of the hardest things that we've ever walked through in our entire lives. I showed up to the first small group, really didn't know what to expect, was like, well, you know, let's go, let's go see what this is about. And I was just blown away. I remember leaving that small group being blown away, like, oh my gosh, just the connection, the support, the love. And, and for us, it was like the solidifying factor. This is where we're supposed to be. This is amazing. And so I just want to encourage you, if you're not a part of that, go to ccl.live and make sure that you join a small group. Amen. A couple more things coming up. This next Saturday, March 30th, we're partnering with the community and we have an Easter egg hunt. It's happening in Kit McConico Park. Okay. So we're going to be Laying like, uh, laying, we're not going to be laying. We're going to be passing out <laughs> over 10,000 eggs, and we need volunteers. So the more people that we can come, just helping hands, the better. If, if you want to volunteer, you can sign up at ccl.live, and we want you to be there by 930. And then you guys know what? Next Sunday, it is next Sunday, right? Yeah. Easter. Easter is next Sunday. Kind of a big deal for us Christians. Wouldn't you agree? Awesome. So next Sunday, it's going to be amazing. We have two services that's happening, one at 9 a.m., another one at 1130 a.m. If you came in, you should have seen a stack of these on your seat. You got a couple of them. Everybody did. What we want you to do is just hand these out to somebody. Just use this as, a, as an encouragement to invite them to church. And guys, I don't want you to just view this as a card. I want you to view this as a person. Take this to work. Take this to school. Go talk to the neighbor that... When you pull up in your driveway, you try to avoid every time you get out of your car. Go talk to them, hand them a card, and invite them to church and say, please come with me to church next Sunday. And we just believe that God's going to plant seeds and encounter people's lives next week. Amen. Also, in the foyer, we have these door hangers, same kind of concept. There's going to be a group of us. I know me personally, I'm going to take some of these. I'm going to go hand them out in my neighborhood. I would encourage you to do the same thing. Take two or three. You say, I don't have time to go you know, hit a whole neighborhood, but maybe you could go knock on your neighbor's door. Maybe you could go two or three houses down, just right beside you on both sides and hand these out and invite people to be here with us next Sunday. And again, that is at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Amen. All right, before we leave, I'm going to take up our offering. I love this, guys. This is uh, Something that we don't want to overlook, this is, this is a, a spiritual thing that we're doing. And so I have a text for you. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, just real quick, I have a short passage. 6 through 11. The Bible says this, Remember, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So 
You could read that and think, what does this have to do with giving, right? I'm not a farmer. It doesn't make any sense to me. He's painting a picture here. He's using this as an illustration. He says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. This is the, listen to this amazing promise that comes next. And God will generously provide all that you need. Isn't that an amazing promise? Yeah. That God gives us this instruction, but it's followed by a promise that if I become a giver, God has literally said in his word, this is what he'll do. He'll see to it that he gives me everything that I need. And he goes on to say, you will always have everything that you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one that provides seed for the farmer. Can you say seed? seed. And then bread to eat. Can you say bread? bread? In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Then you then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take our gifts to those that need them, they will thank God. I just want to tell you these two principles. According to the scripture, if we look back at uh, verse 10, he provides seed. Say it again. Say seed, seed. For the farmer and bread to eat. God gives every single person these two things. Every person in this room, God has given you two things. He's given you bread. And he's given you seed. What is your bread? Your bread, he gives you bread to eat. Your bread is for you, right? God gives you finances. God gives you provision. And what's it for? It's for you. It's for your consumption. It's for your enjoyment. Can you say amen to that? It's for you to eat. It's for you to enjoy. But God doesn't only give us bread. The Bible also says that he gives us seed. So what is seed? Seed is what God gives us that's not meant for me to eat and for me to consume. Seed is what God puts in my hand that's given to me in order to sow, right? And so you need to understand this, that not everything that God gives you is bread, right? Not everything that God gives you is meant for you to eat, and not everything that God gives you is meant for you to sow. So don't sow your bread, but don't eat your seed. Amen. You know, I just want to encourage you with this last thing before we pray over our offering. Uh, so we know that God gives us bread. That's for me. That's for my family. That's for my provision. But he gives us seed. I also do believe this. I live with this conviction and reality that we are going to be accountable to everything that God gives us. If you've never read uh, in the Gospels, there's different parables, the parables of the servants where God, uh, it, it paints this picture where God gave this portion to three different servants and he told them to invest this and multiply it while I'm gone. And when he came back, there was an expectation of how did you use what I gave you? And so I just want us to all pray and, and think about that reality. How am I using what God has put in my hand? Am I, for some of us, guys, sometimes we get so zealous and passionate. Sometimes it's like, am I sowing my bread? But then the other question is, am I eating my seed? What has God given me? And so I want you to just ask yourself this question right now. I want you to think about everything that God has put in your hand and everything that God has brought to your life. And I want you to ask God to reveal this to you. Lord, what is my bread out of, out of this? What is my bread and what is my seed? And when God reveals that to you, just be obedient and do what he says. Amen. I pray the Holy Spirit will speak to you clearly. So let's pray over this offering and over this service, if you'll pray with me. Uh, and by the way, i get ahead of myself. If you want to give this morning, you can go to ccl.live, or also there is a basket. There is a, a, not a basket, it's like a wall mount on the back of the room. You can give that way if you have something physically that you want to, that you want to drop off before you leave this morning. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Lord, we just have such great expectation for what you're doing in our lives and what you're doing in this church. Lord, I pray that you would help us by the power of the Spirit to never treat you as just a religious thought or an idea, but to live with the conviction that you are alive and that you're resurrected and that you're real and that you're a powerful, loving God that has the power to intervene and help us in every situation and circumstance. Father, we entrust our lives to you. We just ask you to lead us and guide us this week and strengthen us, empower us to do your will.
In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Guys, one more time, can we give the Lord a shout of praise this morning? Awesome. We love you so much. Thank you for coming. You guys are dismissed. Have a great day.